just a small portion, Father, of what you so richly blessed us with. Lord, we, we pray that you give us the knowledge, the wisdom, the foresight uh, to plan, Father, and to use every sin that we collect here today for your honor and for your glory and the spreading of your precious gospel, Lord. 
There's a lost and dying world that desperately needs to hear the good news of the gospel, Father. Help us to do that. Help us to remember that that is our mission in everything we do, Father. We thank you, Lord, and we love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Page 212, keep on the firing line. Or we're going to have, as always, have our lyrics on the screen. So, uh, everyone, please stay when you get there. And we'll, y'all know the drill. We'll do the first verse together. And fellowship time, they come back to sing the third verse.
Okay. 
17 verses 32 through 35. Acts 17, 32 through 35. If you want to go ahead and turn there. And let's all stand when we get there at the reading of God's Word today. Acts 17, 32 through 35. And we're all standing. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, while others said, We will hear you again on this matter. So Paul departed from among them. However, some men joined him and believed. Among them were Dionysius the Ropagite, a woman named Damaris, and others among them. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you again for this day. We thank you for the song service we've had, Father. Uh, I thank you personally, Lord, for everyone that makes a morning worship service possible. I pray, Lord, that we would just keep in mind that this is all about you. It's all about praising You, lifting You up on high, putting You in first place, Father, where You certainly deserve to be in every one of our lives. Lord, as we continue to study uh, Your Word in this series, Father, I pray that You would impress on our hearts how important it is for us to reach out to a lost and dying world, Father. In fact, that was the mission Your precious Son gave us. After the command to follow Him... <coughs> We're told to be fishers of men, Father. So help us learn how to do that. Empower us and encourage us to do that very thing, Father. I pray, as always, you would give me every word to say and every thought to have uh, as I deliver your message from behind this sacred day, Father. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. As I mentioned, today is the third part of a four-part series called Deep Soul Fishing. We're looking at the mission that Jesus Christ has given every one of us as Christians and as Christian churches. And that's to go out and be fishers of men. Some of you think, well, this this is, I, I don't have time for all that. I don't have time for all this silliness about fishing and all these little fishing analogies. I don't even like fishing. This is I just don't have time for all that. I've got I've got work, I've got family, I've got other things I do in the church, and, and I just don't have time for all that. But let me quote Theodore Roosevelt, who said, Big jobs are usually usually go to the men who outgrow the small jobs. Until we commit ourselves to do the little things that God calls us to do every day, He's not going to bless us in a big way. He's never going to give us the big jobs until we're faithful in the small jobs. And I, and I challenged everyone here last week 
you were here last week, you remember, I hope you did it, that every one of us could invite one person during the week. That we could all invite just one person. And if we all do that, you won't have to be the one that goes out and wins the world to Christ. I'm not asking anybody here to be Billy Graham. I'm not asking anyone here to be the Apostle Paul. And, and I don't believe God is either. I believe He's just saying, do your part. You're a team. I brought you together for a reason. Because you're all supposed to work together. You're supposed to encourage one another. And if everybody will just invite one. We looked at the statistics. If we'll all invite one, statistically, based on who will respond, who won't, if we'll all invite one unchurched person in six years, we'll have 19,800 new members. In six years. I've done the math. I like looking at that again and again. Because I think if I just invite one person a week from now on, if everybody here will do that, and then everybody who comes in with each to do that. And what that's called is fishing. Be fishers of men. That's what that is. You know, I remember when I was a kid, uh, uh, I, my dad and mom took me fishing. I remember uh, dad taught me how to how to throw the reel out there and throw the bait, how to put the bait on the hook, you know, and, and all those things that he taught me how to do and taught me how to how to fish, you know. And, and I remember one of the most exciting things, and, and still is, uh, I get a great thrill of this even today when I get to go fishing. When you get a bite. I like fishing with bait. Bait, it's called bait fishing, you know. You put a worm or a minnow or something on your hook and you throw it out there and you got a little float called a bobber. You throw it out there and it floats around and, and when that fish grabs that bait, you see that bobber start bouncing in the water and you see it go under. Oh, that's the most exciting, exciting thing. I love that. Well, let me tell you that there's no thrill in the world like sharing the gospel with somebody and seeing God, not us, seeing God and His Holy Spirit literally break their heart and to really be there and see somebody become a new creation, a new creature in Jesus Christ. To see their entire eternity change in an instant. There's no feeling in the world like that. There's no feeling in the world like getting to minister to somebody that needs it. But we're talking about fishermen and fishing and uh, you know, fishermen have all kinds of technology at their disposal today. <laughs> they have GPS, which is that, that technology, global positions, it just fascinates me. You know, that, that's 24 satellites. And all 24 of those satellites in outer space circle the world twice a day. And then you, most of us on our little smartphones even, can access that technology and those satellites triangulate a position and can tell you exactly where you're at at any time, anywhere. In fact, it's pretty neat. Uh, me and my dad, we like to play golf. We, we play golf more than we fish. And uh, even on my little phone, I, I have the GPS technology show me exactly how far I need to hit my ball. And then, and then it would show me how to get back out of the woods from where I hit my ball. <laughs> I love GPS technology. Fishermen use that technology especially today. They use depth finders, which send a signal down to the, the through the water, and then that signal returns to the receiver and it tells them exactly how deep the water is right where they're at. Fishermen use sonar. Sonar is, is, is a neat technology. It was developed in World War II for submarines and it's used to find objects in the water. But now today, fishermen have something that's even... I'm just fascinated. It's a combination of GPS and sonar in one unit and it can show a fisherman exactly where a fish is in the water. Fish can't hide, folks. <laughs> I almost feel sorry for the fish. <laughs> Mainly because I don't have one of those sophisticated units, so I just have to guess. But I thought about that and I thought, you know, I can take this piece of, of technology that's using satellites from outer space and technology from World War II submarines and it can show me, I can see a 3D image of a fish down in the water. But you know what it won't do? It won't make that fish bite. It won't make that fish bite. And it'll show me exactly where that fish is. But it won't make that fish bite. 
You know, as I, I think about this, and and, and it just it just continues to uh, it continues to show me truths in God's word that relate to mission. The more we get into this, because we know, and we've talked about the last couple of weeks, how easy it is and how accessible the fish are. We all know people that are not in church. We all work with people or have friends and have family that are not in church. And if we don't, as we saw last week, it's our job to build relationships with people that aren't in church to try to get them in church. You know, the Apostle Paul is probably the greatest spiritual fisherman that's ever lived, besides Jesus Christ. And the Apostle Paul, in all his travels, at one point, here where we're studying, he's gone to Athens, Greece. And if we we'll look at verses 32 through 34 again, Paul's in Athens, Greece, and it says, And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, while others said, We will hear you again on this matter. So Paul departed from among them. However, some men joined him and believed. Among them Dionysius, the rope of God, a woman named Damaris, and others with them. Now the truth of it is, is we see three ways that people responded to the gospel message Paul had given them. Now, we understand that, that Athens, Greece, was then, and my understanding is still today, one of the most godless places on the planet. Many beautiful structures and art and 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 and, and a, a lot of a lot of great ideas have come from Athens and that culture. That was the 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 philosophic capital of the world in Paul's time. That was the center of uh, secular learning in the world in Paul's time. Folks, it was the toughest place in the world to catch fish. But Paul, ever the great fisherman was up to the challenge. And folks, we see how people responded differently. Some mocked and went away. Some, some listened and said, ah, we'll hear more about this later. And some believed. Those three responses, everybody you share the gospel with will fit into one of those three categories. Will respond in one of those three ways. Now, what we've got to understand here is Paul was a good fisherman. Paul knew what he was doing, okay? He was the Apostle Paul. Very learned, widely thought of, even by historic, even by secular historians, Paul is thought of as, of as the probably the greatest mind of the first century. That's saying a lot. There's a lot of smart guys there. Paul was probably the smartest. He knew what he was doing. And yet, even the Apostle Paul, when he put the gospel message out there in a way that probably nobody else ever has since, even he had a lot of fish that didn't buy. You know, that should be a great encouragement to us today. It really should, because that takes the pressure off you and me as fishermen. Well, even the greatest spiritual fisherman ever couldn't catch everybody. Okay? Even he missed some. But we're going to see that, that all people that we share the gospel with are going to fit into one of these three categories. First, some will reject the gospel. If you look at verse 32 again, it says, And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. Some mocked. See, some people, when you share the gospel, let's be honest about it, some people, when you share the gospel, are not only going to reject it, but they may even be hostile to what you're trying to tell them. Ever run into anybody like that? And you know what? That's the group of people we as Christians and, and thinking of evangelism and thinking about sharing our faith, that's the group we fear the most. And then the devil will work on you and say, you know what? You don't know enough about the Bible to argue with them. You don't know enough about the Bible to answer their questions. You don't know enough about your own faith to witness to somebody that is hostile and even antagonistic toward the gospel. Maybe be true. That don't mean we're not supposed to fish. You share what you know. 
When I remember, I remember first feeling the call to preach, first feeling the call into the ministry. And I talked to a very good friend of mine, and I and I had all these reasons why I couldn't be in the ministry, why I couldn't do it, why I certainly couldn't be a preacher, because I I, I didn't know enough about the Bible. I, I didn't know I didn't know what I was talking about. I hear Brother Benny Tate talking about his early days in the pastor and, and telling about preaching out of pisms. <laughs> In the book of Job. <laughs> and I can relate. Because <laughs> I, I felt that way completely inadequate so many times. And the devil likes to tell you, you're not good enough. You don't know enough. You're not good enough. You can't do it. The devil is the king of, you can't do it. But I couldn't get away from it. Because I love Jesus Christ. Plain and simple. And I committed my life, especially again a few years ago, that I just want to serve Him. And He said, Tim, you are to be a fisher of men. If you're going to follow me, you're going to be a fisher of men. And you've got to understand that some fish are not going to bite. And some fish are even going to try to jump in the boat and eat you. You're going to run into the great white shark. You're going to run into a bear poop every once in a while. And that's just the way it is. But here's the good part. Here's the encouraging part. Our fear is that most people we try to witness to will be in this category of rejecting the gospel. But the fact is, out of the 180 million unchurched people in America, only 5% fall in this category. If you're from heaven, that means one out of every 20. That was for Bridget because she graduated. <laughs> She's really smart, so she knows it's okay. <laughs> but our fear is that most people, that's what the devil would have you believe. The devil would have you believe that when you go out and try to share the gospel, that people are going to be mean to you. They're going to reject the gospel. They're going to be uh, uh, very unwilling to hear what you have to say and even argumentative with you. We won't know what to say. We won't get, know what to do. And we'll get our feelings hurt. I heard somebody say one time that, you know, I, I, had a, I had a good experience witnessing to somebody. They were very receptive of what I say. God was with me. Well, let me tell you what. If that person had got cussed out, God was still with them. If people reject you, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting Jesus. They're rejecting the gospel. That's not on me. I'm not trying to preach the gospel to him. I can't get anybody to heaven. So if they reject the gospel, they're rejecting Jesus Christ, not me. It's not personal. Only one out of 20 of unchurched people in America following that truth. But you know what? Half of that group of people, half of the people out there that would completely reject and even be antagonistic toward the gospel, half of that group believe in a literal hell. Half that group believe there's a hell. And of that group, 62% say they would probably go to church if they were invited by a friend. 62%. Of people that are hostile toward the gospel say they would probably come to church if a friend invited them. What? That's an encouragement right there. Even if they reject you, they'll probably come to church. Now keep in mind. Keep in mind. The man we're talking about that preached that sermon on Mars Hill about 2,000 years ago, the Apostle Paul, he was in this category. He was antagonistic toward the gospel to say the least. He hunted down Christians. He was trying to stamp out Christianity. He was the most hostile toward the gospel of anybody in that day. That should be very encouraging to us. Nobody is outside the reach of God. Nobody's outside the reach of the gospel. Nobody's too bad or too far gone for the grace of of Jesus Christ. But that's one category. Some will reject the gospel, but some will respect the gospel. Let's look at the rest of verse 32. 
It, it said, and when they heard the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, while others said, we will hear you again on this matter. We will hear you again on this matter. Now these are your fence sitters. These are the people that will respectfully listen to what you have to say. They'll, they'll, they'll engage in a conversation with you about it maybe. But, but they're not in any way ready to accept the gospel. They're not in any way ready to give their life to Jesus Christ. You know, a man was uh, a man was taking a survey in New York. He was on the streets of New York. He was he was doing a survey, and he he he, he stopped a man. And he says, "Sir, do you know what the two biggest problems in America are?" And the man says, "I don't know, and I don't care." And the man taking the survey says, "You're exactly right. <laughs> the two biggest problems in America: ignorance and apathy." I think the biggest problem we have in the American Christian church is plain old apathy. We just don't care about the lost anymore. We just don't care. I think that's the biggest problem in the Christian church today. But you know where the biggest Christian church in the world is? You know where the biggest Christian church in the world is? Michael knows. It's in Seoul, South Korea. And it was founded in 1951 by a man named Youngie Cho. At their first church meeting of Youngie Cho's church in Seoul, South Korea, they had six people there. Himself, another pastor, that pastor's three daughters, and a woman that just came to the meeting to get in out of the rain. In 1951. A few years ago when, when Dr. Cho retired from the ministry, his church had 830,000 members. 830,000. I asked myself, how in the world? 830,000, how in the world? You know what he taught to do? He says, just as the Bible talks about our relationship to Christ and each other as the body, Everything that you have become, every piece of information that made you what you are, started with a single cell. Now his idea is that we can only build a big enough building to house so many people here. And there's actually about thirty-five or 40,000 that go to the central church where he, where he preaches live every Sunday, or he did. But the idea was to have what he calls sales. Those are little house churches where somebody says, I'm going to take a group of people, I'm going to invite people into my home, and I'm going to share the gospel with them. We're going to show Dr. Cho's message. We're going to fellowship together. We're going to talk about Jesus Christ. And, and they do that in homes all over China. And then when their home church grows too big for that home, they split off and form another cell in somebody else's home and somebody else leads that. So by this division of cells, they grew from six people in 1951 to 830,000. They're meeting in house churches all over China. Not all over China, all over Korea. But I had China on my mind because I wanted to mention that. That's where the fastest growing area of Christianity is. Communist China. And probably the most difficult situation for Christianity to grow in the world is Communist China. And that's the fastest place that Christianity is growing. You know that, that the, the Christian church in China over the last 10 or 15 years, they've been training up mi missionaries to go out from China to other parts of the world, even to America. China is sending missionaries here to America to tell us about the gospel. Why? Because we are too busy to care anymore. Folks, look back in history. The places where the gospel has spread the fastest and the places where Christianity has thrived the most are in some of the most difficult possible situations. The early church here in Acts, they were under intense persecution by the Roman government. Yet the church flourished. We talk about communist China. Seoul, South Korea was, 
was mostly Buddhist before Young Cho came on the scene. Places that are very antagonistic and even hostile toward the gospel and toward Christianity are where Christianity thrives. But Christianity has been on the decline in America because we don't care. We're comfortable. We're just comfortable. We're okay with our neighbor going to hell. At least that's what our actions show. We're okay with our friends and some of our family going to hell. Well, I try to tell them they don't listen. Most people in this group that will respect the gospel, most people in this group will come to church with consistent encouragement by a friend or family member to do so. In other words, don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. Let me tell you. This is the largest unchurched group in America. That's people that are neutral to the gospel. It's 30% of unchurched Americans following this group. 30% of Americans following this group. Neutral toward the gospel. This group respects Christians and the Christian church. In a study, a survey said that 86% say they would go to church if they were invited. 70% of this group believe in hell. <coughs> they're concerned about where they're spending in turn. The question is, are we concerned enough to tell them how to get to heaven? That's the second group. Then the third group. Some will... Respond to the gospel. Again, we're in verse 32, and it says at the end, We will hear you again on this matter. They were neutral to the gospel. Then in verse 33, so the Paul departed from among them, and then in verse 34, however, some men joined him and believed. Some men joined him and believed. There's 20 million people. In this last group in America. Twenty, there's twenty million people out there that would respond to the gospel if somebody just cared enough to share it with them. If we just cared enough to go fishing. One out of ten unchurched people are just waiting on somebody to share Christ with them. 97% of the people in this group say they go to church if they were invited. Why? Because 90% of them believe in heaven and 80% of them believe in hell. They are very concerned about their eternity. They just need somebody to show them the way to Christ. Remember what we said last week? 82% of all unchurched people, 82% of all unchurched people would be likely to come to church if we just invited them. If we just invited them. Now folks, understand this. The Apostle Paul, even himself, had people fall into all three of these categories. Had people fall into all three of these categories. And the fact is, is every one of us are in the fishing business. Every one of us are called to be Jesus fishing boats. Every one of us are called to go fishing. Do we care enough to do it? Do we care enough to do it? Eighty-two percent. I can't get away from that. Eighty-two percent of unchurched people would be likely to come to church if they were invited. I remember a movie that came out a few years ago. I know many of you have seen it. It's called The Passion of the Christ. And I remember sitting in my living room. I remember sitting on the couch and I remember watching that movie on my TV in my living room. And I remember the part 
with the Roman soldiers take Jesus and they chain him to a stone pillar and they start to beat him with that cat of nine tails and every time they struck him the blood just splattered and I remember they hit him over and over and over and over and over and I remember watching that and everything in my world just went away I couldn't think about anything else but all I could think about was would y'all please quit hitting him I knew it was just a movie but I knew in my heart it really happened and they kept hitting him and they kept hitting him and they kept hitting him and when I thought they couldn't hit him anymore they flipped him up and they started again that image is burned in my mind and every time we get to a place where we don't have time to invite our friends and family and neighbors to church every time we think they won't listen to me they might even be mean to me every time i think i i, I don't have time or or i don't know who to invite or or or, or i don't know what to do i don't know how to do this it's just too much trouble. They're going to think I'm some kind of religious nut. Well, you know what? I think we probably need some religious nuts. I think we probably need some people that are crazy about Jesus. I think we probably need some people that, that wake up every day and think, I've got to see somebody get saved today. I've got to tell them about Jesus. After everything Jesus has done for me, and I think about that image of him being beaten over and over and over. I can't get it out of my mind. He cared so much for you and so much for me. And all he says is go fishing. Let's go fishing. As Miss Donna comes back up.